Hello friends, I'm Pastor Chester Hitchcock. Have you ever thought about the people that Jesus chose to spread the gospel? Jesus called 12 disciples to serve as his closest companions. In John chapter 1 verses 37 through 49 tells us of Jesus calling Andrew and Peter, James, John, Philip, and Nathaniel. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, we find Jesus calling Matthew to be a disciple. Then Philip brought Nathanael, also known as Bartholomew. Then there was Thomas, a twin, James, the cousin of Jesus. Some believe that he was a brother. That would be another topic that we could discuss sometime. Simon, the zealot, Thaddeus, and Judas, all to total the original twelve. Andrew Peter, James, and John worked as fishermen. Thomas, Nathaniel, and Philip, they may also have been fishermen because they were all together in fishing when Jesus appeared to them in John chapter 21, verses 2 through 8, following his resurrection. Matthew, called Levi, worked as a tax collector for the Roman government. Simon was known as the Zealot. Zealots were involved in politics primarily opposed to the Roman government. Judas served as the treasurer of Jesus' band, and John chapter 12, verses 4 through 6, identifies him as a thief and an embezzler. The Bible doesn't tell us what he did before becoming an apostle or a disciple. The Bible provides no information on the profession of Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Thaddeus, or James, the son of Alphaeus. It is so refreshing how Jesus called average people as his disciples or apostles for furthering his work. He could have simply just gone to the theologians, the religious leaders. So what can we learn from Jesus' choices? First and foremost, that all who follow Christ are his disciples, and he can use each one of us in ways that we would never imagine if we would only allow him. The work, the words, the questions, and even the mistakes of these disciples are interspersed throughout the four accounts of the gospel and in the book of Acts. In these books, we can find encouragement as we see how Jesus taught his disciples and worked with their weaknesses. When it comes to the actual teaching of the apostles, there is a level of ambiguity. For example, Church tradition ascribes the four accounts of the gospel to the names given to them, like Matthew was written by the disciple that has the name Matthew, etc. However, there's no proof that they were the actual authors. In fact, the only authorship that is certain in the New Testament are those books written by the Apostle Paul. If we can learn from Jesus' choosing of his original twelve disciples or apostles that he is capable of using any and all followers in his work of sharing the gospel, what can we learn from his choice of calling the apostle Paul on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9 verses 1 through 9 and how he was used? Now keep in mind that Paul was also known as Saul of Tarsus before this conversion. And most of what we know about the Apostle Paul comes from his epistles and the book of Acts. Before becoming a follower of Christ, Paul was a prime example of what was known as a righteous Jew. He came from a God-fearing family in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3. He was a Pharisee like his father in Acts chapter 23, verse 6. And he was educated by a respected rabbi named Gamaliel in Acts chapter 22, verse 3. His Jewish credentials included his heritage, his discipline, and his zeal. In other words, he was a theologian. This is a point that should not be overlooked. Because of his superior training and his knowledge of Scripture, coupled with his understanding of the gospel, Paul was able to correct even the Apostle Peter in Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Paul writes more than half of the entire New Testament. Paul's epistles actually give the academic and scholarly side of what the other apostles had primarily only in their hearts. 
In essence, Jesus was the teacher of God's word while on earth, and while he promised the Holy Spirit would follow to guide us into all truth and declare to us all about Christ, Paul seems to be the one to take up the mantle that Jesus left behind as the teacher of theology in the flesh. Why is this important? Because the Bible is clear that God wants both our hearts and our mind, our brain. He wants us to think and to learn. Some Christians focus so much, though, on knowledge that they neglect the heart. They learn a lot of facts, but they don't surrender their heart to Jesus. Both are necessary according to Scripture. John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24 says, True worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Truth means in the mind, in the brain, studying. But then also we can find in 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, that says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, rightly dividing the word of truth. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16, it says, I will put my laws in their hearts and write them on their minds. And Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12 says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and pastors who teach for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. In other words, God certainly instructed and taught some to be able to teach others. From the people whom Jesus chose as apostles, we can learn a great deal. Here I've only touched on a couple of things. First, that each person who follows Jesus can be used in mighty ways. And second, that God's word is simple enough for those who are without formal training and yet deep enough to demand the need to invest and research with brain matter. To really think and search things out. May we not be satisfied with anything less than God is willing to teach those who are willing to open their minds and their hearts to understand. If this video has been helpful, give me a thumbs up. And if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, hit that subscribe button, ring the bell, and choose all so that you can be sure to get a notification the next time I publish a video. God bless, and I'll see you in the next one.